Well, the first thing they're going to see is our chair. <laughs> That's the seat for the champion of our jousting tournament. It was made from a tree that was cut down shortly after the museum came here. By a blacksmith, no less. <laughs> but uh, entering the shop, um, we have a gate which is normally kept open. Occasionally we might have to exclude the public from back here. On the left, tea handled augers. Boring, but necessary. <laughs> Literally. Yes. And then we have our 1876 uh, lathe. Very, very nice piece of equipment, still used. It's beautiful. In fact, I used to make uh, my wife's rolling pins on it. <laughs> she was a professional baker and very particular. <laughs> Much harder than doing fancy turnings. Okay. Around the wall, sorted turning saws. We have a uh, interesting little phenomenon from 1894. If you've ever done some heavy duty coping work, mm -hmm. okay, for uh, crown moldings in a uh -huh. house or something, you ever twist the blade and have it break? I have. That How about one that steers? That is pretty intriguing. Is there is there a way to lock it during use? Would it ever no. twist while you're by? No. No. Done a little bit of work with it, and uh, it's, it's interesting. I've only seen this one to get my hands on, and there was uh, one picture in uh, probably going to miss the last name badly, but Shondor. Oh yeah, the, the dust collection guy. Yeah. Azul Zinski or whatever. Yeah, okay. Like that. Hungarian name. Yeah. Uh, did a, the art of tools. Yep, I have it on my bedstand. I know the book. And it's in there. Okay. It's a great coffee Schwartz table book. Did a, Christopher Schwartz did a quick video of something like that. And one of his students brought that in to show it to him. And I remember when he posted it on his blog. I said, we have one of those. <laughs> I immediately took a video on my iPhone and emailed it to him. Look. Not Big deal. <laughs> yeah. Um, but apparently it was not a major uh, selling item back then. Okay. You know, because they're relatively hard to come by now. Um, but the look on finished carpenters' faces when they see that. We had two of them in here one time that were uh, working on crown molding. Mm -hmm. They didn't even know what a bird's mouth was. <laughs> they got an education in here. I must be some weird mix then because I actually have made bird's mouths in PVC trim. <laughs> what do we got there? Bird's mouth. Oh. Gives you a portable scroll saw yeah. combined with a coping saw. Clamp it to the table, put the blade in a round hole, piece glaze on there and you can just saw right away. One of the many projects available to members of the hand tool school. Like so. That's great. And of course, you can't have too many clamps. And those kinds of jigs and fixtures are what really is this disconnect between older hand tool use and modern hand tool use. Isn't that part of the point? Is that it seems to the the method of using the tools has gotten lost and a lot of the use was jigs and fixtures and things like that that made it much easier to use than just freehand in the tool? You know, I don't know. I mean I think I think there is a there's a something to be said about that, but I think most of the jigs you find are from the uh, the carpenter and joiner's trade. Okay. Um, you know, where you had to do a lot of repetition. Cabinet makers didn't have that much repetition other than cutting dovetails for drawers, you know, it was Every piece was kind of a one-off type thing, but a lot of, like, when you look at, um, well, the bird's mouth fixture, what's another good one? Um, all kinds of little jigs for house rights, for specific cutting, specific angle joints and timbers and things like that. I think that's where a lot of it came from. I don't know that there was really any uh, particular movement that drove people to, say, well, to use jigs more often. Um, necessity. You were necessity. Yeah, you know, if yeah, you're going to do the same right. thing 47 times in a row, and it's easier to have that little guide that you can sit on there and yeah. yep. make it. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. Ultimately, if the master of the shop had it, the apprentices got them. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, well, it is interesting though, because so many of the, the jigs we see are, I mean, they're so simple because they had to be cobbled together, you know, on site or something like that. You know, the, the bells and whistles we see in our jigs today just doesn't happen. No. It was all a board with a V-notch cut in it. The jig should take less time to make than what you're trying to make with the jig. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and it's not pretty in the slightest. As long as it, it, it has to pass the engineering test, does it work repeatedly? If it does, it's good. It doesn't matter what it looks like. You know, it is interesting, though, because I find um, there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of that kind of knowledge is lost. And you wonder, mm -hmm. you know, how was it done before there was somebody thought of this jig? And... Uh, um, Compound cuts are a perfect example. You know, you don't compound moldings, compound miter cuts, compound any cuts have become this big deal. Now it's about the, the tilt of the blade and the setting of the fence. Well, how was it done before that? How was Joe Carpenter, who was straddling a roof beam, you know, 20 feet up in the air, expected to form that compound butt joint for the steeple on, you know, the old North Church or something like that? And nine times out of ten, it was just this intuitive draw a line and soften a line. There was no jig involved. And mm -hmm. I think the jigs kind of came in later. Um, I don't know whether, I, I certainly wouldn't go so far as to call them a crutch. I just think it was, we moved from, what's the word, individual one guy making that to right. piecework, where suddenly you could highly specialize in a, a task and do it over and over and over again. I think that's where the jigs came into play and then they started to find themselves into other cabinet shops after that. But, Definitely, mass production, I think, is what really brought about things like jigs. But, you know, that, the bird's mouth is probably a bad example because the bird's mouth has been around, yeah. you know, since people were doing marquetry in, in 16th century France. You know, we're using those for, uh, that was the marketer. And even the French get something right. <laughs> there is a book that was printed in England in 1904 wherein the author expresses the opinion that every shop should be well equipped with large numbers of the Colt cam action cramp. And I'm happy to say we've got a few of them. That is a nice clamp. It is. Cast iron, gonna last forever. The bottom piece just caught, yeah, slides just. up. <laughs> Do you want to keep going around the outside, or should oh, we pull yes, to the benches? I think so. um, okay. As you can see, we're trying to balance uh, having a shop with a tool display. Okay. Okay. Now, in the shop, we've got the wherewithal to support actually five trades. Wow. Okay. The turner, the woodwright, rural domestic, the jointer, mm -hmm. do floors, doors. Trim, windows, fixed furniture of a house, cabinet maker, portable furniture, okay. and some people call it carpenters. We now call it timber framer. We can support them too. Okay. And you'd never find all of those guys in the same shop. No. Okay. Probably not even in the same bar. But <laughs> the uh, the tools don't care. They pretty much go from one trade to the next. Back wall, saws of various types, again, bow saws, turning saws, up at the top, uh, sash saws, one, two man, just generally straight cut, um, frequently used to get uh, veneer. Okay. Um, down below that, a few different examples of draw knives. Some broad hatchets, ha sorted hammers and mallets, and then the plane collection, the uh, bench planes, and to the right, the molding planes. Work benches, 1900s workbench out of Baltimore from a chair maker in the process of uh, being rebuilt but it's also being used right now to display tools for school tours. Okay. The one in the back is the one we actually use the most, and that one uh, was a uh, 
undertaker and coffin maker, and maker from Bergen, New Jersey. Now you're about to walk past the scroll saw, the professional woodworker's tool. Earliest patent date on that thing is 1876. The latest one is 1904. So we're pretty certain it's not older than April of 1904. Okay. Uses a standard six inch pin type scroll saw blade, which wow. certainly hasn't changed since 1904. Beats pretty much any scroll saw on the market today. Yeah. I guarantee you. You got, will cut anything. Got a bigger table, got 23 and a half inch throat capacity, and I guarantee you that nothing Delta is producing in this century is as pretty. That is absolutely true. <laughs> I have a I have a vintage late seventies Delta scroll saw and it's it's not attractive. Uh, this we have cut stock up to five quarter. Wow. If you look at the panel saws up on the wall, uh -huh. partly to uh, emphasize the fact that each one of them has a different size or shaped hole in the handle, finger hole. Okay. Okay. So what we did was we brought those saws to a board, traced the hole, brought the board to the scroll saw, cut it out, mounted the shape up there, and we know exactly where each saw goes because it can only go in one place. Particular project going on here? No, no, just demo. <laughs> what do you make it puzzle pieces? But yeah, once uh, uh, there's very little effort. It's all on the ankle at this point. It does wonders for your calf. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is it hard to balance with no. one foot going like that? No, no. You're actually a tripod, one foot and two hands. Okay. It's amazing how quickly you get adjusted to adjusting the, the foot movement for what you're doing. It's very much like the lathe over there. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the speed is, is, once it gets going, once that flywheel gets going, I mean, I'm barely cocking my ankle at that point. It just cuts like a dream. And you get about 12 to 15 strokes where there's no cutting going on for every foot stroke. Yeah. Huh. So it, it's a very, very efficient tool. We did have to replace the leather belt. They don't make cows like they used to. <laughs> now, what's on this last bench? This last bench is uh, really it's a it's a planing bench, but it's a little high for most people. I'd like to take it down by about six or seven inches. Um, but we use it for long molding things like that. Um, right now, we've got. Uh, a saw sharpening vice there. The this is, of the shop. Yeah, this is this is a hunk of uh, plum that uh, one of the guys is going to be using for tool handles. We've got a couple of uh, boring machines that would be used out for timber framing jobs. Oh, okay, that's those. Okay. So you could bring it to the framing. Out to the site, lay it down on the the beam, mm -hmm. and then you sit down on it. Sit right there and crank away. It. Requires absolutely no knowledge. The master framer sets the angle, lays it out, and the guy just sits there and turns the crank. Average chimp, no problem at all. Uh, That's one of those innovations, those Civil War innovations uh -huh. we were talking about earlier. That you know, there, many of those are patented right around the war, near the end of the war. Um, great tools, really fast, and they have a ratcheting advanced mechanism on them as well, so it controls everything. You just sit there and crank with two hands and it sinks it, you can set the depth on it and everything. It's and then cool. you pull it out, move it, and just stay within the marked lines. Oh, that's great. Like I said, the average chimp can handle the job <laughs> perfectly. So, now the, uh, the bench and molding planes, of course we always get the comment from somebody, you guys don't have a router in here. At which point we immediately come back, and what about the router plane? <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> but we even have the wherewithal to make uh, the threaded uh, vice okay. shafts. But not out of... Avocado. 
we were talking with Kenneth Woodruff on Wednesday, and he was going on about how he, he had these convoluted ideas of making his bench screw out of avocado, and then he started to cut the threads in it, and it didn't go so well. I can't imagine that would work. No, apparently it didn't. No. There's, there's a good reason why they consistently used the woods that they did. Yeah. 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 It worked. Yeah. Why, uh, why, do you, why do you only use black birch or elm for the nave of a wagon wheel? Very simple. The grain reverses every year, it interlocks, it doesn't split. Just like plywood. Try splitting yeah. plywood, doesn't work. Well, good plywood. <laughs> what, uh, what happened here last week? I have no idea. What were you doing while I was I, gone? I did not. Is this some sort of new fence mechanism? Can you make a cove molding on that thing? Sure. I suppose. It would work. This is, um... <laughs> 1894. This thing's a beast. And it's... <laughs> That's the name of it, too. It takes three people to operate this. You've got two foot pedals on that back side, and they push down on each pedal to get the thing turning. The flywheel, God knows how much it weighs. 500 pounds? 600 uh, pounds? My, my guess is that the entire thing is about 600 pounds. We had to get it out of here at one point when they put a new roof on the place. And we put two two-by-fours through there, and it took eight people to pick it up and get it out of here. Wow. The issue is, is I, mean, I suppose you could get one person on this end, but once you get it moving, you the pedals continue to move. So you get your shin whacked real quick. Okay. <laughs> well, the other thing, too, uh, every once in a while we get somebody in here who insists that one person can do it. And we usually manage to convince them otherwise when we tell them that they're going to be on two pedals, working up and down like a stairmaster, leaning over a spinning blade and performing open heart surgery. I can't think of anywhere that would be convenient per se, but is having the pedals stick out of the outfeed side the best place to put them? It... Well, that's why your pedlers are like this. Right. Okay. And I guess mechanically it's easier to have them in line with the blade. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There, there are a lot of things that are a little odd about this. I don't know if there was at one point um, a, a hand crank on the side, because I've seen a lot of these that have some sort of crank over here. Well, you, you in addition to the pedals or in lieu of the pedals? In addition to the In pedals. addition. Gets a third yeah. person in there. Many of I them, can't imagine turning a crank that fast. <laughs> many of them have a, have a treadle, and these pedals don't work in, op in opposition. It's just a central treadle. Okay. Uh, the, the table saw in, in Roy Underhood School, for instance, is just a central treadle, but he's got a, a hand crank on the side, and it's it's geared like a, a great wheel lathe. I mean, there's some gearing down in order to turn the thing, and so someone can stand on one end and push the, the treadle, or someone can stand off to the side, I suppose, if you needed to do a long rip cut, where standing on that end would get in the way, you sit here and crank it. And... But you can also take the treadles off and go to a jack shaft system if you have the wherewithal. Okay. 1894, if you were in Manhattan, Mr. Edison's electric grid was available. Get a half horsepower motor, it would be about that big, bolted to the floor, and away you go. If you've got a water That wheel, sounds like a solution to me. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. One of the students here nicknamed this the Beast. It screams like a jet engine, takes three people to run it, and it's generally a miserable experience, but we'd rather use one of those table saws. <laughs> when, when new, would it have had a fence like we would see today on a table saw? Or would you always have just clamped something on it like you, what's on there now? something on. Clamp it down. The only thing you've got... Yeah, there's a miter. A little Two miter slot. Okay. Um, some of the later models I've seen do have a perpendicular miter slot, and there's... Essentially the same type of deal. Um, obviously, the flip this around so mm -hmm. the fence is out front, and there is actually you can tack a fence onto it. So that would have been times. the fence. Yeah, yeah. A lot of times it's actually a single point. But fence. so with this being more geared to run the miter slot, would this have been used more for cross cutting than ripping? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be any massive amount of ripping on this. It would seem like a lot of work to rip on this thing. <clears throat> You can do it, we've done it. Yeah. But frankly, I'd rather grab one of those rip saws. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. These are better cut, too. Yeah. Now, this blade could probably use some sharpening, although it's pretty sharp. It is. 
I mean, there's, there's, it doesn't get run that much except for demonstrations when people insist on finding out how much work it is. <laughs> yeah. The depth on this is set. I mean, the, the, the table. The table cranks. Yeah. So oh, so that's how you adjust the depth. Yeah. Okay. That's why the, the whole thing kind of at an angle like this. The more you, the more you lower it, the more the blade right. comes up. The blade is fixed. The table raises and lowers it. You don't adjust 600 pounds of cast. No, no, you don't. That's how much. Anything else people should know about the shop in the museum? Uh, well, we teach. Our blacksmiths teach blacksmithing. We teach woodworking. Uh, we have a spinner and weaver who also teaches. When's the best time of year for somebody to come visit? Uh, between the first weekend in May and the last weekend in September. Is that when you're open? That's when we're open. <laughs> and we're only open on weekends. This okay. is an all-volunteer outfit with the exception of one person. Yeah. And, I mean, we, we have festivals throughout the year. We have a Blues Festival, a Medieval Fair, mm -hmm. um, Celtic Festival, um, a lot more races on... Summer fun days. Summer fun days. Summer and fun days <laughs> a lot. I mean, those are, those are the biggest turnout days, and there's live music and things like that. So if you wanted to pick day when the most is going on, those kind of work, but those tend to fall on the hottest parts of the year, too. Okay. <laughs> and all those. So, for those of us working here in the shop when it's 98 degrees and 98% humidity, it's, it's, not the, uh, it's not the best day. Yeah. Now is a pretty beautiful day, actually. Yeah, it really is. We belong to the Society of Workers in Early Arts and Trades, which is better known by the initials. Sweat. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, we are, um, I mean, you know this, we, we're always looking for volunteers. I and mean, right now it's pretty much Wade and myself in the shop on Saturdays. Okay. And uh, that's hard to do. <laughs> that's very hard to do. Um, so anybody that wants to come out and play with the tools or learn how to use the tools, yes, we'll, we'll take you. You know, we just re re require you to show up. That's really all, we, all it takes. Yeah. The idea is... If you don't know anything about it, but you want to learn, that's all you need. Yeah. You know, nobody need come in with a chest full of uh, tools. Um, in fact, we encourage people not to buy them until they need them. Certainly. And then we can assist with a little guidance. There's but, plenty of tools around here that need sharpening. We can teach you how to sharpen. <laughs> well, that's lesson number one in any case. You know, have, a, have a seat. Here's a chisel. <laughs> Here's how you do it. Now let's see what you do. Right. When you're done with that, sharpen my chisels. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I let them. I've got a couple that I use for apprentices. <laughs> they they don't get their hands on the artifacts until we've, we've got a, the one area over to the side. I think the habitual plan is to turn it into a kind of a tree and process type. So a lot of our you know, splitting, malls, wedges, gluts, and things are over here. Plus, we've got these one man crosscut saws. Um, probably the only time anybody's ever seen one of these is Roy Underhill working with one in front of his shop. And as I understand it, he's got one and we've got the other two. And we've got two of them. <laughs> and we've got the one with the instructions on it. <laughs> but the intent is that you'll be able to come in here and go all the way through the felling of the tree to a hand-hewn beam ready for construction. Okay. Yeah. Right now this is kind of storage area. And we've got uh, kind of an interesting collection of uh, lathes though. Yeah. Including yeah. one that I suspect is a uh, salesman's model. It's tiny. It is. I'm is that the building we're standing in? No, uh, that's no. Not. actually that is a model of the house where this museum started. And it's accurate to the point where if you can see, the, uh, the joinery is done. You could actually scale off of this and build a house. Wow. You notice everything's pegged. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for showing us around, Wade. Oh, we appreciate pleasure. it.